going to pass it over to FJ, FCJ Refugee Centre and Giovanna, you have the floor for five minutes. Thank you to the members of the committee for having us here today. My name is Giovanna Blagovchanin and I am the Anti-Human Trafficking Manager at FCJ Refugee Centre. I'm joined here today by my colleague Chiara Rossi, who is the Anti-Human Trafficking Women's Coordinator. FCJ Refugee Centre is a grassroots community organization based in Toronto, Ontario. For over 30 years, the FCJ Refugee Center has supported hundreds of hundreds of individuals and families, many in precarious situations, in accessing services and regularizing their immigration status. With an open door and holistic approach, we offer a unique integrated model of providing supports and services such as housing, shelter, and integration to migrants. These include migrants who may be at risk or are, or are victims of human trafficking for both labor and sexual exploitation. Through our work supporting survivors of labor trafficking, we have recognized that women are highly represented in cases of labor trafficking. This is not a male dominated issue. Within our cases in the past year, 40% of these have been migrant women. Migrant women are highly vulnerable to exploitation due to their gender, precarious immigration status, language barriers, and limited knowledge of their rights or available resources, which in turn results in limited access to their rights. Women are exploited in all sectors. We see women trafficked in sex work, domestic servitude, factories, restaurants, hotels, farms, and cleaning services. These women have limited options to exit their situation and are, not, and are often threatened with violence or with deportation. In fact, traffickers often use their victims' precarious immigration status against them as a form of control and coercion. In addition to these barriers, we often see how women have difficulty securing safety due to inadequate integration of gender perspective and analysis in relevant law enforcement services. For these women with precarious immigration status, there are limited remedies to secure stability. First of all, even though IRCC's policy does not require victims to collaborate with law enforcement agencies or testify against their traffickers in order to receive a temporary resident permit for victims of trafficking, in our daily practice, we observe that many such TRP applications are denied when a case against the trafficker is not pending. Whether this is because no investigation was initiated by law enforcement or it has been concluded in court. Uh, this is particularly true for both initial and subsequent TRP, TRPs for victims of labor trafficking, which are refused at a higher rate than sex trafficking victims. As a result, if there is no criminal investigation ongoing or the case has been concluded, she is left with no status, no justice, and very few options to safely remain in Canada. Furthermore, while some victims may be granted a temporary resident permit, there are almost no permanent immigration remedies. Current options are exceptional in nature, making it difficult for victims to be successful in obtaining permanent residency. In turn, this creates uncertainty in the lives of victims and their families, whose future depends on the unpredictable outcomes of their immigration and criminal proceedings. Finally, if granted a TRP, the victim will have barriers in accessing essential services, such as housing sub subsidies available to domestic victims of trafficking or other vulnerable women, provincial financial assistance, here in Ontario, this would be Ontario Works. And most importantly, she will have no right to family re reunification. As a result, mothers are unable to reunite with their children in Canada and have difficulties visiting them in their countries of origin without losing their status. We therefore recommend that a gender perspective is better integrated in law enforcement and other services, that temporary status is granted to victims regardless of the existence of an investigation or criminal proceedings against their traffickers, as established in the 
the relevant IRCC uh, policies, that clear and consistent options for permanent residency are developed to re respond to the needs of survivors, and finally, that adequate trauma-informed and victim-centered services are offered to all victims, regardless of the immigration status. We are grateful and honored to be here to be able to bring this perspective forward, to be able to bring forward labor trafficking as an issue that does impact women, especially migrant women. And we are grateful to be able to bring forward the perspective of all migrant women today. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much, and I appreciate that. We're now going to pass it over for two and a half minutes to Adrienne LaRoche. Adrienne? Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to ask you a question, Ms. Abdel Kader. You mentioned the Roxham Crossing, and we started examining status. What we've heard with the Roxham Crossing is the importance of health services, housing services, all of these things are important. But the other issue is that when people aren't regularly supported, it is easier for them to, to lose their status and they become vulnerable. And it's impossible to find them, to offer them those services. So what is the impact on human trafficking? And these people arrive and are either lost or are poorly welcomed. And then they're found in a vulnerable situation. I um, would like to give my time to Giovanna and Chiara. Giovanna and Chiara with the FCJ Refugee Center are really experts on the question of claimants. They advise us at the Association on our Human Trafficking Project. But at the Association for Canadians, we just started working with claimants, whereas FCJ has more experience. Thank you, Monica. Um, yeah, the without status, um, traffickers or employers or abusers, anyone is ex can exploit a... Um, uh, the victims in it in ways that because they know that they can't access any services they can say that um if you if you don't do this if if you don't do this for me if you don't work under these conditions that we will um will report you to immigration and you will you'll be deported and so people are become dependent on their jobs they become dependent on their traffickers and they usually are dependent on them for also housing as well as was mentioned uh, several times and um many many services and supports aren't available to people without status. E even if they do gain some status, there's still limited services that they can access, like financial assistance. Um, a lot of housing subsidies are not available to people with temporary status. Um, and so that leaves them in a situation where, again, they may be vulnerable to exploitation and traffickers are using the housing crisis um, to their advantage. <laughs> Thank you very much. To um, ask a question of the Ref, uh, Refugee uh, Center. I know that your organization advocates for open work permits for migrant workers in Canada. I had mentioned the dangers of making people illegal, and I think we've had several examples today of why making people illegal, why I support status for all, is, is a necessity to keep people safe. Um, why is it important to, have, or why are open work permits important? Uh, open work permits are important because the alternative is uh, an employer-specific work permit that locks someone in, ties someone into one employer with with one role, and that employer can use that power advantage to exploit the worker. They know that the worker can only work for them, and they're relying on that job for status in Canada. And so they can then say that they need to work under very abusive conditions and no domestic worker would ever work in, and that worker has very little ways to be able to change their employment. It's a challenging, uh, challenging process. Uh, in a very lengthy process, and so many workers will continue to work for the abusive employer simply because they don't have any other choices. Thank and you. And so, so if they had an open work permit. Okay. Thanks so much, Devanna. Now we're going to go to our very last, and we're, what we're going to do it to Manuela and to Michelle. I'm reducing you both down to three minutes. Sorry, Manuela, I see you online. Michelle, passing it to you for three minutes. 
Thanks, Madam Chair, and thank you guys. Uh, great information coming out. I wanted to ask Jackie this question, and I never got to it last round. Jackie, it says in your bio here that you've been working um, in this, not necessarily in human trafficking, but for 23 years. I, I guess what I would love to know, and if anybody wants to, to jump in again, how have you seen human trafficking change in that time? What's different now than it was before? I mean, I don't remember, I'm 43 years old, but I don't remember hearing of human trafficking the way that uh, we hear of it today. Um, I know, I think it's Kiara. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. You had wanted to chat. You had your hand up in that last round of questioning I had, and I just wanted to give you an opportunity to share your thoughts. Oh, thank you. So I just wanted to endorse what Monica was saying in terms of housing and services. Like from FCJ perspective, we work for a lot of people that don't have status or have temporary status. And this is a huge challenge, added challenge to accessing services like housing. Even when some of the services are available for domestic victims of sex and labor trafficking, these same services are not available to people on temporary status, even when we get the TRP. So this access to services is essential and uh, it would help if this was granted to victims, regardless of their status as well. Thanks so much, Kara. I'm now going to pass it over to Emanuela online. Three minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'd like to begin by thanking all of our witnesses for the incredible testimony that we've heard today. Um, very informative, and it's definitely going to help shape the study. Um, I would like to ask, I guess I'll start with uh, Giovanna, if you can, I know you spoke earlier about the VTIP TRV and you said that many of the victims are refused a VTIP TRV. Um, meanwhile, we heard earlier this week from IRCC that, you know, this was a, a pretty good avenue that people can take if ever uh, they are being trafficked or if it's found out that someone without status is being trafficked. Um can you speak a little bit to that point and, and maybe explain, you know, in what kind of circumstances these people are not uh, are being refused? And also, do you have any stats or can you access any stats on how many victims have been refused? Even though one is too many, I think it would help us to know, um, you know, more specifically how many people this is happening to. Sure. Thank you. Um, the So the temporary resident permit um, is available to someone who's out of status, uh, who is a victim of trafficking. Uh, if, essentially, at first, when when approved if or if approved, you would be approved for six months, a short term TRP, and then you would apply for a subsequent one, which is normally granted for a year. Um, the IRCC's policies state that they don't need to speak to law enforcement. There doesn't need to be, um, they don't need to testify in court to be approved. Um, but what we're finding is that um, and we're not just making it up because it states this in the refusal letter is that uh, there is no, that the case has been concluded. Uh, there's no court proceedings and they're not needed to be in Canada anymore. And so they are refused for the temporary resident permit on that basis, uh, which um, is confusing for the applicant and is confusing um, for us as well when we're when we're submitting these applications. I don't have the statistics in front of me um, to state how many people are being refused, but from our cases, um, I can say that we do have large cases that that um, see forty plus victims who might have been approved all for the short term uh, TRPs because there was an investigation, but now their subsequent ones are all starting to be refused because the case has been concluded or in, in the court proceedings are no longer ongoing. 30 seconds. Okay. Um, thanks. Good. That's good to know. Um, I guess another question that I have um, in 30 seconds, though, I don't know if you'll be able to answer. Um, you had mentioned that people cannot reunify with their families. Of course, that's only offered to PRs. So what is it that you suggest, like in a straightforward recommendation that uh, be done for victims of trafficking? Um, allowing um, applicants of temporary resident permits to include family members um, or allowing them to um, having a 
a quicker and much more accessible uh, pathway to permanent residency for victims of trafficking so that they can bring their families. Right now, they need to have a TRP for five consecutive years. This is very difficult, very challenging, and almost never happens, at least from our perspective, from our experience. Thank you so much. You much. This is going to wrap up our panel, our first panel for today. I would really like to thank all of the witnesses. You have brought so much to us. Thank you.